have that have that sense that it is something artists have been doing for years and years, and it, it's kind of developed right through the 20th century. Um, so I'll skip through that for a second. I suppose um, just me and Ross have had lots of conversation about what what is and isn't a kit as well, um, and <laughs> we're, we're kind of moving somewhere between the quite, quite a hardcore definition of a kit, which is uh, a collection of materials, some guidance as to what to do with that, those materials, um, and then an expectation that that kit might be used. So if there's a kit continuum, I suppose, that's one end of it. And at the other end, you might have these kind of slightly expanded publications, um, like uh, on the right here we've got Andy Warhol's edition of Aspen, uh, Aspen magazine, which was a magazine that came in a box in the 60s, so they'd have loads of interesting guest editors, um, and you'd get uh, bits of ephemera and publications and objects as well. And it kind of feels like that expanded idea of um, of a publication could also be seen as, as a kit in some ways. Um, so we're kind of moving between those. So just to give this a, a little bit of... Um, I'm going to skip most of this presentation, actually, because we're running a little bit behind time. But we wanted to talk about kind of some of the ideas behind, um, behind kits and artist-made kits. Um, and we got really excited by this idea of doing a top trumps of kits. Um, and then I also got a bit giddy thinking of, like, where, where did some of these ideas of kits come from? Um, and for me, a lot of it feels like it goes right back to these Enlightenment ideas of, um, you know, the rationally ordered universe being a kit of sorts that these, all these Enlightenment dudes thought um, God had made the universe in a lovely kit form for us to... Uh, and it was nice and, <laughs> nice and rationally ordered. Um, and if, if we kind of developed rational scientific inquiry, um, we'd be able to unpick this kit because the universe is modular uh, and the universe is logically ordered. Um, so, yeah, we came up with some of these terms of different ways we might, we might assess kits. You know, do they give creative license? Are they consciousness raising? Um, what kind of critical pedagogy is involved? Um, all these kind of questions about worthiness and solutionism um, and... Um, and subversiveness, I suppose, are, are some of these ideas that, that maybe move between the kind of make kit culture and, and arts make kits. Um, and I've been thinking about the kitification of the art object, the, the kind of process over the past hundred years or so of, of artists increasingly using kits to distribute um, both, both, I suppose, objects that they're making, but then also uh, the practice and um, activities. Um, this, I thought, was just like a really amazing example of that. Um, Marcel Duchamp's his life work in a kit um, that he, he could then kind of ship around the world. Um, so, just thinking of some of the, the kind of the big ideas that maybe helped artists start working with kits or the antecedents of kits. Um, like early 20th century, you've got artists um, like the, the surrealists who are interested in looking at systems of chance. Yeah, go on. Um. Are these people that you're referencing using the word kit, or you've uh -huh. added that onto those examples? Uh, onto, sorry, which, onto these things I'm showing here? Yeah. Well, when, when does this word kit begin to crop up? Is it in this history, or...? I think, I think like? early 20th century, it's kind of, we're talking more of like, what I'd probably think of as like antecedents to kits, yeah. uh, and things that are maybe kit-like in some ways. But yeah, I don't think the Surrealists and the Dadaists were talking about using kits by any means. Um, but they, they were... things like rules, didn't they, where they would like perform to a set of like, instructions and things like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so I think early early 20th century, you had a lot of the avant-garde were taking quite a systematic approach to um, thinking about creative processes and then sharing them. Um, but yeah, whether that's actually a kit is another thing. It's, it, you can maybe say it's a technique or a set of instructions. Um, uh, but kind of, there were kind of ideas in the air of, I suppose, a lot of modernist painting is looking at revealing the, the, the techniques that artists are using. So it kind of feels like it chimes quite nicely with this idea of functional transparency that we've got in kits. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to make some connections between what was happening at art in the time, some, some of the big ideas that were happening, and then in, com in computing and education, like early 20th century, you've got this idea of um, uh, constructivism from Piaget and uh, Vygotsky, this idea that um, the, the self is something that we're all building psychologically ourselves. Um, so there's these ideas of constructivism were kind of in the air around this point. So 
feels like early 20th century there's maybe a combination of that constructivism um, and the, the, that kind of rationalist way of thinking that does break things up into modular logical units but then you've got artists kind of maybe taking interest in some of that stuff but then looking to completely subvert it the way that the surrealists use systems but then use systems in a much much more subversive way um, anyway I'm, I'm going to skip through some of this because we, we're, we're kind of a bit behind the things um, but we've made we can um, share this Neil can we can share this in a bit so we're going to do an activity in a minute where you're going to have a play with some of these top trump cards that we've made um, and you can kind of use the top trump cards to map out relationships between different artist kits so I'm just going to hit on a few that feel like really good examples I suppose the survival kit by the the, the, the surrealists kind of developed as a practice feels very definitely a kit um, and it, it's kind of something that people would make for, um, you, you kind of create a, a kit for survival um, and then you'd give them to each other so it's kind of a group activity you wouldn't you wouldn't use your own objects um, but it was taking like quite a playful quite a playful approach to the things that you would need for survival in, in modern life um, so it wasn't a, necessarily a a functional kit that you would use to make something or solve a problem. But it, it's kind of a kit that, that you can use to um, have an experience of some objects and encounter them and, and look at these objects in a different way. Um, I'm going to skip through this. Um, uh, I suppose, yeah, the, uh, the Bauhaus uh, is, I think, a really good example of um, taking that kind of modular logical approach to trying to um, um, unpick and, and remake art practice. Uh, Buckminster Fuller's Geodesic Dome is a great example of a kit, I think. Um, I don't think the Situationists would describe their stuff as a kit, but they're, they're, they're almost looking at um, t taking the kind of the, um, the content of the media and using that as, as things that we can then play with and recombine and encouraging people to, to um, yeah, treat the media, um, the mass media, as, as a kit to play with. I'm going to skip through a few more of these. So kind of back in the 60s, then we've got, I suppose, artist groups like uh, Fluxus, who are very definitely using the term kit um, and creating these kind of flux kit boxes. Um, and with conceptual art, there's this, there's this kind of real interest in working with instructions, um, so artists making artworks that are sets of instructions and then also the challenge of how um, how that kind of behavioural art or, um, or say objects that are made through sets of instructions like Solowitz artworks, how that might be documented um, and distributed. Um, let's skip through I suppose. Um, yeah, this uh, What Yam by George Beck feels like an important one in that period as well. That it's it's a kit that's a box with a set of instructions in it, and the sets of instructions for behaviours, which was kind of seen to prefigure a lot of their kind of instructional conceptual art. Um, but to me, that feels very much like that. That is a kit. Um, so yeah, these flux kits are great examples as well. I think. Oh, I've got the wrong picture in there. Uh, Oh, I really love this one. Um, Total Art Matchbox, which was a, a kind of a fluxus <laughs> kit, um, which is just um, <laughs> does what it says on the tin, basically. Um, Aspen Magazine, which we already talked about. Okay, I'm going to keep skipping through. Oh, yeah, Inflatable Cookbook is, is like a beautiful example of a kit, I think, um, that was kind of from a weird mixture of DIY fanzine culture. So there's a group of artists who are interested in making really sculptural and architectural inflatable environments but they also created these beautiful fanzines that mix together instructional guides with weird weird kind of bits of philosophy and prose and um, other other material um, so then um, as we get to the 90s with tactical media and you, you could say I think tactical media artists were, were definitely making things that you would call kits um, whereas maybe yeah, you could say there were some approaches to uh, net art. Say, for example, my boyfriend came back from the war. Not normally described as a kit, but this is this is a kind of uh, an artwork that was like a a very uh, poetic, non-linear narrative about someone's experience of the boyfriend come back from war. But the artist, as well as 
creating that, they also shared the files online and encouraged other people to remix them and rework with them. So it feels like there's a, a kit relationship to that. And then we've got, I suppose, tactical media kits made by people like Critical Art Ensemble, for example, Graffiti Writer. So they um, they published instructions to build your own robot that that could be programmed to wander around spaces um, and graffiti um, bits of kind of bits of agitprop, I suppose, along along the city streets. Um, and they they took a really they've got a really interesting way of combining kind of political writing and cultural theory and instructions as well in a lot of their stuff. Um, so then if we go through early 2000s, we've got that kind of that, um, that explosion of Web 2.0 empowering the, the kind of maker culture and collaborative culture online um, and this kind of rise in uh, participatory art that's then starting to use media quite a lot more. Um, so we've got examples of Tenant Spoon, um, I'm going to skip through these a little bit, um, and mini, Minneapolis Out on Wheels, um, uh, who are a group of artists who are exploring sort of portable live drawing projections onto, onto buildings, but then also publishing the tools that they make and, um, and, and, and kind of publishing loads of how-to guides as well, and that's kind of seen very much as part of part of their practice and part of the things that they're sharing. Um, right, we'll, we'll look at the rest of these in a little bit, so I'm going to skip through here. Da, da, da. Right, so, let's go back to... Um, if we go back to Jim Jams... Um, I might have to just go over back here, so... We'll... Um, okay, so um, Jim Jams was um, an event that took place in Howbridge Leisure Centre, which is which is uh, in Atherton, which is just the other side of Wigan, and it's a project that came out of a collaboration with Helen, um, who who kind of commissions and organises a lot of art out that way, um, and we were asked to look at how this huge space, which is a leisure centre with a swim pool, skate park climbing walls, uh, gym, it, it's, it's very much like a sort of one of those um, massive mega centres that New Labour built uh, back in around that time I think. Um, and we, we were trying to look at how we could bring in an area where people were definitely engaging with kind of health and fitness but not really engaging with art and culture, how could we bring art and cultural activities into that kind of space. Um, so we developed this this project, Jim Jams, which was a kind of cultural takeover of, of this leisure centre, and we had uh, a cinema screening. We had um, we invited lots of community dance groups to come in and perform in the um, in the skate park area and in the the, um, the kind of jungle gym area, and then we had a set of um, we had a, a floating robot or a, that you can see up there that was kind of filming proceedings, and we invented a set of new games and activities that were kind of somewhere between um, sports and play and um, choreography and art kind of movement based activities and on the day it was very chaotic and almost all the technology failed to work. <laughs> um, so we, 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 we kind of like um, got Arts Council funding three weeks before I got this um, massive shot of testosterone and just thought yeah we can do it, we can do everything. Um, didn't filter, what, what, so, so was way too ambitious, um, and as a result, the, the, yeah, none of the tech worked on the, on the day, and we ended up kind of facilitating it um, really lo-fi, so we just kind of fell back on facilitation skills and, and facilitated a lot of those activities without the tech. Um, so we've got Helen here with, with us as well, so do, do you mind kind of saying a bit about it from your perspective, Helen? Passed it on the train. <laughs> but it's a great place, but um, the thing with Wigan is there's no real art specific venues that have been there for you know quite a number of years, but for 
as long as I can remember. Um, so the, the community, young people, don't really have access to these sort of activities, if you like, or access to real quality art provision. Um, so they tend to go outside the borough, like uh, Manchester, Liverpool. So within our own organisation, our own organisation is very much around health, sports, and my remit is very much around um, wellbeing and arts. Um, but I'm always really keen to work with real collaborative, real quality artists as well. They were inspiring, so that's why we brought in Redop to look at this and to look at what we've got as assets. So our assets as an organisation are leisure centres. So we want to engage the most vulnerable groups, most vulnerable communities that are around those areas to engage in the quality of provision. So hence why we looked at developing this program work. So it's just one day, but we did say the, the amount that we could build on, you know, we could do so much and it's a lot of fun. And it was a real crossover of audience as well. So that was a real nice mix as well with families. So it was really, in a lot of ways, it was really successful and I thought it then. So. So yeah, I'd like to develop it more. Um, yeah, yeah, and it was really interesting for us to be given a kind of time and space to try and do something quite experimental in a massive, busy leisure centre with, like, so there's probably like, I think over 100 people around there on the day. Um, so part of what we wanted to do with, with this project, though, is um, look at how we documented and how we communicate this kind of work. Um, because it's such this kind of art and technology outside of gallery spaces that's such a complicated area. We kind of started feeling like we're we're maybe missing we're missing some of how we communicate this to, especially to kind of secondary audiences. Um, so we've been looking at how we might in future, um, as well as as well as having documentary films, we might kind of publish uh, documents and writing and kits that that kind of share some of some of what we're doing as well. So we thought we'd show you, as of Jim Jams, we've got a really short film that Tim's edited together. Um, and then we've also been working with Nathan Jones um, and he's been running some writing workshops with us. So we've been looking at different approaches to writing about these kind of projects. Uh, Nathan's written a bit about Jim Jams as well. So we're gonna watch the film for five minutes and then Nathan's gonna um, read um, some text that he's written about the day as well. So. I'm, I'm just going to press play. We're working together collaboratively with Redoc. We're trying to develop something quite different and create a different offer with inside the leisure centre. So we're bringing lots of different things together where there's a clash between sport and art. <laughs> Area. 
um, and working at performance quality as well. So just looking at a few different things to try to uh, raise their confidence levels and to uh, make them more aware of the different paths that they can take within dance and within performance. Because it's a fashion studio, I was looking for a film that's going to use the space as well. But also, because we've been working with dance groups, there's something they can come and enjoy. We've got a few rows of seats here, but also at the back, we've got a lot of space if people want to break out and make some moves as well. You know, it doesn't have to be a formal cinema. This is a dance studio, and a lot of people um, will want to see the Today it's all about introducing people to new things, getting children introduced to new things, new ways, new technology in areas where they would never ever go and see them before and just see what's on offer out there. Good idea. Camden, make sure you know where people are, Sebastian. Oh, wait. make sure they're watching. <laughs> Playing robot rugby, we had to like win the big way put one foot forward and you couldn't do anything else. I really like them, they're really exciting. I've never done anything like that before. Alright guys, are you ready? Off you go! We're going to start in the centre. We're going to walk slowly forward to this red line. And if you bump into someone or something, I'd like you to turn right at 90 degrees, right back as I go. So, in 3, 2, 1, go. important that people have the diverse range of activities going on because even though we're at a leisure centre it's not all about fitness uh, it's about well-being it's about mental fitness and mental health plays a big part in that and people sometimes are afraid of coming to a leisure centre because they think it is all about fitness and it has this, uh, this barrier around it where it's all super fit people what just go to leisure centres and we're trying to break those barriers down. It's more than just flexing your muscles, it's about being creative and thinking about the future that will be overseen by our robot overlords. It's preparing people of African for the future. I hope you all have a great time and got involved. I hope you've learned something, I certainly have. Um, and we hope to see you all there again. Thanks to Jim Jam for coming down and working with us. And um, hopefully we can do it all again too. Okay, so that was Jim Jams. Um, it's, it's worth saying as well, Jim Jams was produced by Hai Young, um, who spent probably, was it about six months um, organising and, and kind of coordinating different community groups and the people working, at the, and working with the people at the centre so they'd be prepared for us to come in and um, let people strap on giant buttons on the backs and run around the, the, the BMX bowl um, and have a ridiculous weather balloon over the top. So. Um, yeah, yeah, there, there was like so much of it was pr the production and organisation of all that kind of stuff too.